in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth or something of that nature. Honestly, y'all, I'm not too familiar with the stories in the Bible. Barely read it when I was in the church, kind of just disassociated myself. But that's why on my Patreon, our first book that we're reading in the book club I started is Who Do Bible Magic? Because me finding out that my family was hiding the fact that they was doing hoodoo the whole time, I'm discovering the utilization of the Bible in rituals and spell work. So I want to build my understanding of that. So we're reading Who Do Bible Magic is so good so far. The first chapter is called In the Beginning, but it's explaining the spiritual correlation that's within the bible the hidden messages so that's over on my patreon i'll have that link down below if you want to join but today we are going to talk about in the beginning but the orisha version so let me set the scene for you imagine the world we know today but nothing but the sky and the land that we know is covered with just nothing but water so all we have and all we're surrounded by are skies clouds and below water that's currently what's going on in this story but the sky was occupied not only by the clouds but with Olo room and i have not done a video on him yet but the skies was occupied by Olo room and his children which we know today as the orisha so all of the orisha and Olo room was living it up in the sky except for one because like i said there was the ocean so there has to be an orisha that's handling the bottom of the ocean right because at this time there's only an orisha at the bottom of the ocean so pop quiz which orisha which orisha has a territory of the bottom of the ocean leave it in the comments below i'll give you a minute correct olokun or sometimes i say olakun depending on how casual i am when i'm speaking but olokun if you guess you my i guess i'll give that to you too because it is involving the ocean but at this time at the bottom of the ocean there's only olokun i have olokun and your maya videos i'll link them down below but right now the sky and the water they were two separate kingdoms at the time both of them were just minding their own business they were satisfied with what was going on olorun was enjoying his deluxe apartment in the sky ha <laughs> and Olokun was glad that he had all of the waters to himself but there was one Orisha who would spend hours and hours and days just gazing over the clouds onto just water water and more water he was curious as to okay it's just water down there can't something else be done to add to it and this Orisha was Obatala I have not done a video on Obatala as of August 2nd but eventually we will cover him and I'll update it in the description box of this video. Also, when you hear me refer to the Orisha as him or her, you may hear me use it interchangeably because it honestly depends on the story that's being told. They usually aren't assigned a certain sex because their spirits, their energies. So it's, it is fluid. So Obatala knew that this mass body of water had a little more potential. So Obatala is a very curious Orisha. He liked to stay busy and create. He wasn't content with just living in the skies, going day by day. Just like the other Orisha, he had a special gift and he wanted to put it to use. So he looked around and contemplated what could he get his hands into. Then he had an idea. So of course, Obatala went to Olorun to ask for permission to pursue his idea. And Olorun was so pleased and satisfied with his idea, but he's thinking, okay but who's gonna do that i'm kind of already booked and busy up here i mean i don't know if i could take on another project i'm kind of already but obatala was like no 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 this is something that i want to do Olorun believed his idea was a good idea but he's like listen before you go wandering down there all willy-nilly i need you to go consult orumula to make sure you have a little bit of guidance before you start this adventure orumula who is known as the seer orisha the psychic able to see the future i have a video going in depth on him as well but just know he's the seer he's a psychic he's the all-knowing when it comes to the future so Olorun, of course wanted obatala to seek guidance from orumula first so obatala is like no big deal i got you i'm gonna go consult big brother mark and we'll go from there so that's exactly what Obatala did so you may be wondering what is this brilliant idea that Obatala had he wanted to populate the water somehow he didn't know exactly what he wanted to do but he just knew it needed to be something living down there some motion going on some activity so he wanted to just go down there see what's going on see what he could do to add some energy some flow some people some being he just knew that there could be more utilization to the waters below so obatala went to orumula for guidance orumula said okay let's get into it he brought out a sacred tray. He sprinkled some boba tree root on there. He took 16 palm kernels and he threw it onto the powder eight times. And he studied the path and the marks that the kernels made each time. 
This is basically sand divination, which is a form of psychic readings using sand, dust, dirt, anything powdery. Some people use shells, some people use beads. It's just a form of divination. The reader tosses the shells into the sand and interprets the landing and the markings for the receiver. So Orumalu will throw the palm kernels, pick them up, throw them again, pick them up, throw them again, studying the pattern, the markings where each kernel landed. Obatala is just kind of sitting there like, okay, all right, I'm just about your time doing that, brother, like what you doing? During his reading, Orumalu told Obatala to prepare a chain of gold long enough to reach the waters. Obatala's like, all right, I got it. And you need to bring a horn of sand, a white hen, palm nuts, and a cat for company. Obatala understood exactly what Orumala was saying. He knew what he had to gather. He was excited for the journey he was about to embark. But first, he needed to get this gold chain. Now, pop quiz. Which Orisha do you think he went to to make a gold chain? Which Orisha gives blacksmith metal? I can heat it up and bend it and hook it or however you make change. Which Orisha do you think that skill set belongs to? If you commented Ogun, you're right. It was Ogun. So he went to Ogun to make this gold chain. Ogun was like, okay, that's no problem. Slight work. But um, where are you going to get all this gold from? Um, I can make the chain. I'm going to just need the gold first. So Bata was like, okay, he went around to everyone in his kingdom, in his area, asking, does they, do they have any gold that they can spare? Of course they did because they got it like that. So everyone was taking out their gold, anything that they could spare them. I would have gave him my watermelon tourmaline that you can get from blackwoodchaya.com. So everyone was just donating their gold to him because they understood what he wanted to do. So they were willing to help. So Obatala gathered all, gathered all the gold, went back to Ogun and said, all right, this is what we got. Go ahead and make that chain. Ogun is like, okay, that's cute, but um, I don't think this is going to be enough. You need it long enough to reach the waters, right? And Obatala is like, yeah, but that's all I got. Um, Just add a hook onto the end and I'll make it work from there. So once the chain was done, Obatala was ready to embark on his adventure. He took the chain, he hooked it onto the edge of the sky. Orumala came running behind him saying, hey, this is all the other stuff that you'll need. He had a sack with the horn of sand, the white hem, palm nut. He had all his materials ready for him. So Obatala was starting the mission. He was making his way down the gold chain and as he got towards the end, he realized, okay, maybe this chain isn't long enough for what I needed. He felt the moist in the air from the ocean, but he was too far off to land safely. And of course, he's going to land in water. So he's like, okay, maybe I should have asked for a floaty. Then Orumala shouted down to him, throw the horn of sand. That's how I imagine it sounded. Throw the horn of sand. So Obatala is like, okay, he reached in the sack. He took the horn of sand and he threw it down. Then Orumala yelled again, throw the hen. And Obatala is like, throw the hen. Then Orumala's like, yeah, throw it. Nabata's is like, okay, I'm going to trust him. He can see the future, so I'm sure he know what he's doing. So he threw the hen down, and the hen landed perfectly onto the pile of sand and did what hens do. Started digging at the sand, trying to dig a hole, but as the sand was, shot, was shooting up into the air, it started building valleys and mountains and hills and land, basically. So Obatala was finally able to jump down on dry land, and he referred to this land as Ife, meaning the land that separated the water. So now Obatala is thinking, okay, this is what I'm talking about. Looking better already. We got something going on. The waters are separate. I can walk around freely. He liked what he saw, but he still felt like it was a little bland. But he remembered that he has a palm nut. So he's like, okay, let me get a little greenery going on. So he took the palm nut, he buried it into the sand, covered it up. And as soon as he did that, a giant palm tree sprouted from the seed. And the palm tree began dropping a bunch of palm nuts where he was able to plant even more trees. Obatala took some leaves from the tree and he was able to build shelter. The Obatala and his cat was living it up. They had shelter, they had land, they had access to the water, they had a palm tree they were already making progress but he remembered that he needed to update all over him so obatala called for his handy dandy trusted psychic a guillermo a chameleon 
Now let's pause right here because I know you're probably wondering where in the world did this come a come on come, come a chameleon come from? I thought there was no life there. Now there's a random chameleon that's just easily available. So depending on the storyteller and the translation, many people believe that the chameleon is symbolic to different things. Some people believe that Eshu in this story is represented by the chameleon because we know Eshu is the messenger correct so with the chameleon being able to communicate with obatala and send the message back up the change to olorun it's symbolic to the messenger how we send out prayers to no matter who we send out prayers to no matter which orisha it always go through eshu first because he's the messenger so some people believe that he's just represented in the story as a chameleon other people believe that oduwa is represented by the chameleon because he's the orisha that is known to observe all things that happen on earth and there are some people who believe that the chameleon is symbolic to all versions and translations of the creation story the one i'm telling now is different amongst different practices traditions you're going to hear different versions because it's not an actual event but a story to better understand the religion of the orisha life lessons to show that the orishas aren't perfect just like their children as a chameleon we must adapt to the new environment the new translations the new practices that we will take that will take place and the new generations that are formed and will continue practicing the same religion i hope that makes sense so obatala called for the chameleon agirmo to give olorun an update on what's going on so agirmo went back up the chain and told olorun obatala doing his thing down there he doing real good as you can see everything looks good but just as you can see obatala can't really see it kind of gets really really dark down there where he can't really see so he was wondering if he could do something about that and olorun is like okay i understand he needs some light all right let me see what i can do so from there through meditation and concentration olorun was able to create the sun to shine light on obatala so he could better see what he was doing so obatala is like perfect we got this big beam of light now i can work longer and i can really see what all needs to be done so while on this journey obatala realized he had a cat for company but he was still lonely he wanted someone he could talk to share his feelings with and someone who could talk back so while he was wandering around, figuring out what he was going to do about that, he came upon a pond because he grew thirsty and he was able to see his reflection in this pond. So he's looking back at his reflection like, who is this man I see? So he was so impressed by his reflection and that gave him an idea. The sand that met the pond, clay basically, he took some of the clay and he started mimicking his face. He started mimicking the way his arms looked, the way his chest looked, the way his legs looked. He would make a clay human basically. He'll be satisfied and he'll make another and he'll make another and he'll make another. He grew thirsty. He would take some palm juice from the palm tree. He would drink it, set it down and he was on a roll. He would just make another and another and another. And then he grew thirsty again. But the juice that he had before from the palm tree has been sitting underneath the brand new sun and the juice was fermenting while it was sitting there while he was making his clay humans so the next time he would take a sip instead of drinking juice he was drinking wine he enjoyed the taste so but he kept drinking it and drinking it and drinking it and drinking it till he was drunk but he was still determined on his mission so he's still making these clay humans his eyes are getting crossed. He's getting a little lightheaded. His hands aren't being as detailed as they were before. So what was first perfect little claymations of humans are now starting to look a little bit different. Some had longer arms than the others. Some had one long arm, one short arm, one long leg, one short leg. Some were made with really big heads. Some were made with really tiny legs. Some was made too big. Some was made too small. They were all just looking a little different. I don't want to say deformed, but different. Obatala being determined but yet drunk looked at his work and said okay perfect these are the little beings that need to be around me they're just like me so he shouted up to Olorun I have made these beings but they're nothing until you breathe life into them so Olorun saw what he did and was like okay I trust you you know what you're doing so he shot out a big breath of life into all these beings and each of these little clay figures were now humans living breathing operating humans so let's take a pause right here this reminded me of the creation story that i learned in christianity involving adam and eve in the garden of eden you know how they ate the apple from the tree of knowledge in the center of the garden and from there they realized that they were naked and they clothed themselves and from that mistake and from that disobedience 
they were now known to be the reason why human beings aren't perfect. So it just reminded me of Obatala drinking from a tree when that juice fermented into wine. He was then started to make humans that weren't so perfect. So it's just funny to me how that both involves a tree. Because once the humans were formed, Obatala taught them how to build and garden and little villages were formed. Then once Obatala started to sober up, he took a look around and realized she looks fine over there. She looks fine over here, but she looks a little off. He's able to carry that rock, but he's struggling with it because one of his arms are oddly too little. Why do they all look different? And then he realized he made all those mistakes because he was drunk. And from that moment, he vowed to never drink again. Now, let's add in a different version of this story from this part. We'll get back to that one. Going back to when Obatala started to get drunk, he told Olorun, I'm making these little human clay babies. When I'm done, I want you to breathe life into them. But as he continued to get drunk, he fell asleep. And then as Shu came down the gold chain trying to figure out what he was doing and he realized, okay, these little clay figures look nice over here, but these ones look completely different than those. Those, these don't look like me. Those look like me, but those don't. And then he saw the fermented juice, the wine basically sitting over there. And then he saw Obatala laid out sleep and as Shu was like, this man is drunk. So you would think Eshu being the kind person that he is, he would fix up the figures for him because he get what he was trying to do. But Eshu being the trickster that he is, decided to continue on making these disfigured figures. Once he made a lot of them, he just went back up the gold chain laughing because he knew what he just did. And then Olorun would look down and see that Obatala was sleeping like, okay, so he must be done with these figures. He's resting. Let me breathe life into them. And then when Obatala would wake up, he would see all of these different people look different why aren't they all shaped the same why aren't they all constructed the same and he realized that he made mistakes while he was drunk and she never revealed to him he was also the reason why some of them looked disfigured as well because he added on to the chaos and, now, and from that day obasala vowed to never drink again so that is just a different version of the story from that little snippet a different translation but we're going to get back to the story where obasala is now realizing that he made all those mistakes because he was drunk he thought it looked fine through his drunken eyes and once he started to sober up he realized what he did he was so hurt by it because it felt like he felt like it was his fault which it kind of was that everyone was just made with different qualities i would say which is also a reason why for people who have altars for obasala they're told not to give him alcohol as an offering due to this vow that he made and now this situation is the reason why he is the protector of all people, especially those who are disabled or differently abled and vulnerable. But just so I'm not confusing y'all, the SU part where he came down the gold chain, that's just a snippet from a different translation. But we're going back to the one where Obatala was drunk and he crea created all those figures himself. So now the village is starting to grow. People having babies, babies and more babies. Now this once small village has turned into a little city. Obatala continues to help them with different skills and survival techniques and as years went on Obatala was like okay I think my mission is complete I think they're able to operate themselves I'm going back up to the sky but y'all can call me though I'll be back down here soon he went back up to the sky and all of the Arisha wanted to know what how to go tell us how it went was your mission successful like give us all the details so Obatala went down detail for detail telling them everything he did the ideas he had what it created giving them in the entire backstory so the Orisha were so impressed with what Obatala did they kind of wanted experience down below as well they were like can we pay them humans a visit down there it seems like they're living it up this is so different so the Orisha went down to live amongst the humans for a while they really enjoyed it and when they return they're telling all the room like oh my gosh those humans down there are so cool. They're so nice, hilarious. We really enjoyed it. Olorun is like, I know they're wonderful. That's why I want y'all to watch out over them. Have some close to you that you will call your own children, but you must answer all of their prayers, no matter who your children are. So that's when each Orisha was assigned to be the head Orisha over different people, but they were able to communicate with each and every one of them. So you know how they say your Orisha selects you before you were even born? 
this is how so i know this story sounds so wonderful so peaceful the orisha love living amongst the humans so they adopted some as their own children to watch out over them to answer their prayers everything seems so wonderful and peaceful and just such a beautiful story but mind you while all this is going on olokun is at the bottom of the ocean looking up like okay so what's all this commotion why are my waters separated what's this big chunk of mass object that's in between my waters what's all this stuff that's changing no one asked me to disturb my waters i was the only one occupying this space now it's about 50 11 of y'all where did y'all come from also when the orisha came down to live amongst the humans they all took their place on land too you know like a choice and Rinlay, they was like okay we got the forest you know yeah my y'all was like okay well i need the top part of the waters you know she was like okay well i got these little rivers over here and so olokun is like like, what mm -mm, mm -mm. y'all were up there why are y'all here now olokun was not happy and she was like listen i'm about to shut this whole thing down i'm taking this whole city out so olokun started stirring up her waters in anger about to flood everybody out every single human every single house they built every single plant that they grew taking everything out and that's exactly what she did almost majority of it the flood knocked out over half the people and all the developments the remaining people started praying to Eshu to contact obatala to let him know what was going on that they need their help obatala went back to arumala for guidance like hey buddy you ain't tell me this was gonna happen arumala told obatala like you've done enough you rest up here i'll handle it arumala did a reading and he knew exactly what he needed to do Orumala made his way down the chain and he used his powers to stop the flood and he defeated Olokun and the people of the land were so happy they were like listen can you come down here with us to protect us from this ever happening again and Orumala was like yeah no I don't want to be down here but instead I'll help y'all a little bit I'll teach y'all about divination so maybe you can see stuff for yourself and be able to help out yourself I'll do that for you but I'm not living down here I'm going back up there and from that moment, Orimula has never been seen walking the lands of the earth again. So Olokun is like, okay, you got me there. But Olorun, I'm going to challenge you to a weaving contest. Basically a fashion show. Who got the better fits? You want to be in charge? Let's see who really got the pieces. Let's see who really looks more royal to be in charge. And Olokun felt so confident with this competition and just knew no one could beat her. Because you guys know all the secrets and the riches are at the bottom of the ocean. Olokun is known to be the richest Orisha because that's where all the jewels, the knowledge, the secrets are. So Olokun was like, okay, I got you there because I know what I got down here, you ain't got up there. So Olorun heard of this battle that Olokun wanted to do. And he was like, oh, she want to battle outfits. Um, oh, oh okay, sure. We can, we, we can do that. Of course, he was a little nervous because he was like, who going to be Olokun in wardrobe when she got all the jewels, the fashions, the stuff that we don't even have yet? So he decided to get the chameleon, a Guillermo, and like, hey, you go down there and you judge. We need someone that's unbiased. So you go down there first, see what she has, then come up here, see what I have, and then you tell us who did it better, okay? So the chameleon's like okay y'all petty but sure so Aguirmo, the chameleon went down to the bottom of the ocean told olokun like okay olorun is up to this battle show me what you got so olokun was like bet went back to her closet pulled out the most flashiest garments nice patterns brilliant colors and textures and stepped out in front of Aguirmo, like mm -hmm, yeah you see me and then all of a sudden olokun started to notice that Aguirmo, the chameleon was starting to change his skin into the colors and pattern of her garment so she was like okay that was easy for you to do let me go get something else she pulled out an even more flashier garment with different patterns and textures and colors like try to imitate this and that's exactly what Aguirmo did he transformed his skin into the exact color of the garment and it happened over and over no matter how flashy and gaudy the fabric was Aguirmo was able to transform himself into that exact color. So Olokun confidence started to die down. Like if this little giant lizard can mimic my fabric, that means he's seen this before. That means this is nothing to him. That means Olorun got something better and I refuse to be embarrassed. So I'll back down. So Olokun was like, okay, you got me. Tell Olorun that he wins. I will submit to his power. 
and uh, sent him my greetings. So Guillermo did just that. He went back up to Olo room saying, listen, we got her. She got nervous. As soon as I started transforming my color, she backs down. It's all you. We're good to go. She's going to leave the human people alone. She's going to let them have their little land. We're all going to live in peace and unity. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the creation story. How the Orisha started claiming us. This is one of many translations. That's how we have our head Orisha now. Because Obatala wanted to populate this land and he did just that that's why we're all perfectly imperfect and we're maneuvering through life because what fun would it be if we were all perfect anyway and that's also symbolic to the orisha not being perfect people so of course their creation aren't going to be perfect people as well Whew. I want to give a thank you to Caramel Drizzle TV for introducing me to the book African Myths, which is basically like a comic book book version of the story that simplifies what happened, make it easier to understand. So I'll have Caramel Drizzle TV information linked down below and the African Myths books linked down below as well. Let me know what you think of this story. Let me know what translation you were taught, what details may be different for you and what you took away from the story. Also, let me know what Orisha should I cover next. I think it's about time for Obatala. I really do. I've been holding off on it because I know it's going to be a long video, but I feel like it's about time for Obatala. But thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. And like I always say, as above, so below, as within, so without, as a universal, the soul. Until next time, you guys, I'll you.